This is your urgent call to action. We are all called to lead in a world in chaos, crisis, and turmoil. Join a pivotal global movement for change to transform the leadership crisis worldwide. Will you play it safe, or will you wake up, step up, and speak out? Like Nelson Mandela did for South Africa and the world, we need a radical new way to think, act, and lead, leading boldly into the future. Join host Ann Pratt, a Harvard fellow and multi-awarded businesswoman, and unlock the best version of yourself to revolutionize leadership with what the world needs now. Greetings to all you future bold leaders. Thank you for joining us from around the world. My name is Anne Pratt. I'm formerly from South Africa and relocated abroad to attend a Harvard Leadership Fellowship in beautiful Boston in the United States of America. Our bold leader today joins us from Geneva in Switzerland, the European headquarters for the World Health Organization and the International Red Cross. He is a dutiful American medical doctor a world-renowned infectious disease epidemiologist, a pioneering champion of change who has worked for, with, and in global public health for more than 35 years. He's appeared on the front cover of Newsweek. He has been recognized by Time magazine as one of the world's top 100 most influential leaders, and he has had more than 2.4 million viewers of his TED Talks. He has served in more than 50 countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. He co-founded and led Gavi, a global vaccine alliance to accelerate vaccine access to the poorest of the poor worldwide. And he co-created COVAX, the global emergency response to COVID-19, the worst pandemic in more than a century. We warmly welcome Dr. Seth Berkeley, and welcome to Leading Boldly into the Future. So Dr. Berkeley, thank you so much for making the time. I know it's later at night in Geneva. It's a real privilege to have you with us today. Thank you for having me. You know, in your, in your life, you've had a remarkable career. Um, you're a global champion of change in, in public health. And um, uh, I know you've spent since August 2013 at Gavi, um, this Global Vaccine Alliance. Can you just start by telling us a little more about Gavi, its purpose, its mission, and its global reach? So actually, I was involved with getting Gavi started, which was started actually around the year 2000. And the reason was there were exciting new vaccines that were changing the landscape, targeting some of the largest killers of children in the world, but because they were new and expensive, they weren't getting out to the places where they could make the most difference. And so the yeah. idea was to create a public-private partnership, and that was launched in 2000. Actually, Nelson Mandela was the first chair of, of the organization. And um, it began slowly because it was a new concept of raising money and, and being able to engage with industry. Um, I joined it actually in 2011. Um, yes. As the CEO, even though I had been involved at the beginning, I had been watching it closely and um, worked to really accelerate the activities. It, is, it vaccinates now more than 50% of the world's children and also has introduced 550 new vaccines in developing countries, which has reduced vaccine preventable diseases by 70% and um, has contributed to a, an under five child mortality reduction of around 50%. That's remarkable. That's truly remarkable. And more recently, you've really spearheaded and co-founded COVAX, uh, which has been the world's, I believe, the only multilateral solution to the current global pandemic of COVID-19. Can you share with us a little around COVAX, what what motivated that? What ignited that process? And, and where are we now in the world with COVAX? So, um, you know, the, the, we were at the World Economic Forum in Davos, um, and it was about three weeks after the first identification of the virus, or at least the public identification of the virus. Later on, we found out that there were cases earlier than that. And 
you know, we ask the question, um, um, is this the big one or is this a dress rehearsal for the big one? And I was sitting yeah. with a colleague, Richard Hatchett, who runs um, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. And we said, you know, well, look at what happened in the last, the last pandemic, which was flu. There was vaccine made quickly, but none of it got to developing countries quickly. And we said, could yeah. we do something different here? Now, of course, it was, um, if you think about it, if I knew what it was going to take and the amount of work, I might have thought about it uh, twice, but um, I didn't. We jumped in and we started out in a great place. Now, we started out, we had no money and we had no staffing to do it. And we really had no mandate, so we had to build that. Yeah. But the other really interesting part of it was, um, you know, the, 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 the idea was to have vaccines simultaneously in rich and poor countries. And we did pretty well. We ended up, um, after the first vaccine in the UK, 39 days later was the first vaccine in a developing country supported by us. And we were in the process of trying to move forward. And then we got hit with vaccine hoarding and vaccine nationalism and um, export bans. And so we spent a lot of 21, you know, disappointing people and being in a difficult time as there was a separation of, of wealthy countries having vaccines and poor countries not. Um, we ended up asking for help um, and, and countries began to donate doses, which wasn't part of the original story. And, and where we are today is we've delivered more than 1.2 billion doses, and we're on a, uh, a pathway towards having enough doses for countries. And we're still dealing with inequalities because some of the countries that are really um, have weak infrastructure, weak health systems, are, don't have high coverage rates. And for those, we have to really work carefully to try to understand what the problems are and try to solve those. But I think, you know, the, the we've done much better this time than we did in the past, but it wasn't good enough. And I think everybody understands that. So in that process, I mean, you spoke about the fact that you didn't even have a mandate. You didn't have resources. You didn't have a mandate. I believe you've engaged partners and funders across 193 economies and have now provided um, COVID-19 vaccines for 92 lower income countries. Can you take us through what was the leadership exercise you went through to get the mandate and then to help secure the resources? So I think the challenge in doing this, of course, is we had credibility because we are the largest purchaser of vaccines in the world. But that being said, most of our vaccines are for children. They're not for whole populations, with the exception in, in some epidemic diseases like yellow fever, we may do a campaign that covers different ages. But in general, we provide vaccines for children. So, you know, in a sense, we were the logical people, but it, it wasn't, um, you know, necessarily something that everybody would think, you know, we had to do. Um, and, and, and what we first had to do is begin to sell this as a concept and put together some, some thought processes, some vision for it. But then we also had to very quickly start raising money. And, and we ended up raising um, uh, about $11.5 billion over a very yeah. short period of time, as yeah. well as working with the pharmaceutical companies to get contracts for doses and work on technology transfer to developing country manufacturers. So a lot of process there. Now, of course, you can't do this by yourself. You need a team. And yeah. so one of the leadership things is convincing others to try to work with you and to have them understand that together you can do more because there's a danger in this type of setting that you end up with many different initiatives. They don't come together and they divide, mm -hmm. you know, rather than bring together. So we ended up, as you described at the beginning, um, the only multilateral mechanism to move forward. And um, that gave us some strength in terms of working with the companies and working with uh, the donors to get support. We ended up having 193 countries come together to join us, which was extraordinary. Um, um, we um, ended up delivering vaccines to 144 nations. So um, not all 193 ultimately took vaccines and some took yeah. just a little bit, but the point would be that this was the largest 
gathering of countries you know, um, since the P Paris Climate Accords, and we did it without the U.S. at the time, and we did it, you know, in a sense, as you could argue, as a little, a little um, organization uh, pulling that together. And when you say a little organization, you're talking about Gavi. So when you talk about we, you're talking about Gavi. Um, who were the key stakeholders that you brought to the table initially? in helping secure that mandate and, and expanding the effort? I mean, were there critical stakeholders that you strategically targeted at the outset? Well, of course, we had conversations with developing countries. We had conversations with some of the manufacturers. But then, um, you know, it was critical to get donor resources to get our board on side to do this, to get the board of CEPI and WHO and UNICEF, other leaders that would, would join with us to put together a temporary structure because we didn't create a new legal entity to do this. We worked through uh, Gavi, through CEPI, um, you know, rather than create a, 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 a whole new structure. And all of that was a, was a challenge in, in convincing everybody to be part of that. And then we had um, a, um, a donor conference that was planned for Gavi, for our own replenishment. And what yeah. was interesting, we normally have one or two political leaders, but because of that moment in time and doing it virtually, we ended up with 42 heads of state, including all G7 heads of state, and all yeah. of uh, 19 of the 20 G20 heads of state all coming to the meeting, talking about the importance of this, validating the idea of trying to do this, not just for the world, but also for developing countries. And, and that certainly was a big help in terms of fundraising and in terms of moving forward. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I have no doubt that there must have been some pretty dark, difficult moments. Can you perhaps take us back in time to a specific time and place when you know you were in that moment um what was the occasion what was the key issue how did you feel at the time and how did you navigate out of that well we had many dark moments and many tough moments but I would say one of the hardest was I already mentioned how happy I was to say that 39 days after the first doses, we had doses in developing countries. We had plans for hundreds of millions of doses. We had already yeah. begun to tell countries about those. And then the Delta variant of the virus broke out. And as you know, it was devastating in India. And India yes. at that point, it kind of felt that it was, you know, doing okay and not having a lot of problems. And our largest supplier of vaccines at that point was the Serum Institute of India. We had done a technology transfer there. And the original agreement was 50% of those doses would go to India, up to 50%, and then 50%, particularly for the poorest countries, for Africa. Um, and what happened was um, India um, put an export ban in place. They didn't call it that. They just said yeah. no vaccines going out. And all of a sudden, we had given countries even a first dose of vaccines, and they were waiting for the second dose. And because they didn't say we're stopping it, you know, it was delayed, 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 and it became yeah. terrible. So we had to work our way out of that. Meanwhile, having people in countries say, you know, we started to get protected. Now we're not protected. What's happening here? And so I think that was probably our, our darkest moment. Um, and, and in a sense, the reason it was so hard is because we had set it up beautifully. And of course, the Serum Institute of India ended up producing 1.5 billion doses. They just mostly got used in India. So it was good for an important country. But of course, it left many other countries behind. So what was the point of, of, you know, revelation? What in that process, what was your light bulb moment and what steps did you then take to try and overcome this global disappointment? Well, I mean, you know, first of all, um, the, the light bulb moment that occurred to me during this whole process was at the end, as, a, as a, an infectious disease epidemiologist, when I say we're only safe unless we're all safe, I believe that. And I think early on, people said, oh, yes, they kind of said it, but I'm not sure yeah. they believed it. And, yeah. and when India occurred, and then afterwards it spread around the world, I think people began to say, oh, maybe this is really true. And, and later on, Omicron coming out of South Africa. 
But yeah. um, the really hard part here was that, um, you know, from my perspective, India didn't do the right thing. Had they said, look, we have a terrible outbreak, instead of 50 percent, we'll keep 80 percent or, you know, and but we'll give the rest of the world 10 or 20 percent. We could have at least limped along and helped people con continue their second doses. And, and what happened as a result of that then is a lot of anger about that. And that anger then led people to say, well, we don't want to buy vaccines from India anymore. We want to now make our own, which will have long term implications because India has been kind of the supplier of the world doing it at a great price. And and yeah. um, so these are are really challenges that have you know causes. And, and for me, kind of on the, the moral, ethical kind of things, it does make mm -hmm. you ask the question, let's just say the outbreak was worse. How do you create a situation where people say, okay, I know I have to take care of my friends, my family, my community, but if we don't yeah. take care of the world, it will be bad for us and for the rest of the world. And that kind of goes against, you know, some of the, the, the way human nature is set up. So I think these are some of the things that I struggle with. And, you know, to that point, Dr. Berkeley, I mean, you know, the, the idea of a virus for one is a virus for all. What have what has been the compelling conversation for the skeptics? How have you overcome that thinking? Um, what have been the the takeaways from your from your experience with that? Well, there's two ways to answer that question. One is this issue of we're only safe if we're all safe. And so, yeah. you know, even if you, I mean, some people say, look, we should help other countries because it's the right thing to do from a humanitarian. Um, but I think we also have to say that even if you're not a humanitarian, if you want to protect yourself, you don't want new variants that are appearing and therefore vaccinating the world makes sense. And so trying to get that argument and have people really believe it is critical. But then you've also got the separate issue, which is how do you deal? And, and this is the worst we've ever seen because of the, the partisan nature of politics at this time. All of a sudden, your belief in science, your belief in vaccines became a political issue. So all of a yeah. sudden we had, you know, the, the party you belong to or the state you lived in became a defining feature of whether you were vaccinated or not, not whether you were at risk or not. Um, and, and that became very difficult because in today's world, of course, everybody's connected by the internet. And so when rumors start in one part of the world, they move literally at the speed of light around the world. And so we then had to dissect that out and try to convince countries individual people, healthcare workers, that a certain vaccine was safe, that it, I mean, crazy things, that it didn't have yeah. a chip in it that was tracking people, yeah. it didn't lead to, um, you know, uh, um, uh, contraception, or there were all these crazy rumors that were going around, and, and we just kept having to undo those, working with the social media companies and others to try to do that. How far do you think we are in the world with that battle? You know, it's interesting because in developing countries, we tended to have much less vaccine hesitancy. Now, why is that? You might think it should be the opposite, but the yeah. reason is if you're a mother or a father, you see the diseases around you. Every mother and father wants to protect their families, their children, their communities from those diseases. In the West, where the diseases have disappeared because vaccines are so efficient, they don't, they don't see the need as much. And therefore, sure. you used to have much higher vaccine. So the, the highest level of, of um, discomfort, of, of lack of confidence in vaccines in the world is actually in France, the land of Louis Pasteur. The country that had the highest belief and acceptance is Rwanda, I mean, just to give you an example. Yeah. But in this yeah. particular case, because of the way the rumors were doing, because of the political nature, and because these a lot of these technologies were new technologies, they were done rapidly because of the emergency, there was a lot more fear and a lot more um, uh, uh, vaccine hesitancy in the South. And so we've had to work to um, try to stop that from happening. And um, it, it, it requires different things in different countries, depending upon what the origins of the problems have been. And do you have one example of a country where you were able to shift that perception? 
I mean, you know, it's never perfect, but um, an example would be in, in, in South Sudan, um, you know, one of the challenges there, it's a country that is very unstable, has huge political problems, is not highly educated. And the question is, who has credibility in the community? And there, yeah. one thing we did is we worked with church leaders, but not just church leaders, with um, you know um, uh, mosque leaders, with um, uh, traditional healers, with community leaders. And the reason is is that people tend to trust um, yeah. you know where their social networks are connected. And the idea there was to try to get the information out and have them influence their populations, their religious flocks, or however you want to talk about that. And that's something we learned from working in the past in, on polio and other diseases where getting that religious or community leader engaged was a good way to have people accept something that otherwise they might be afraid to accept. Yeah. How far do you think the world has come and what do you think the current risks are? I mean, you know, we're talking about BA2 now and, you know, where are we? What is your perception in terms of current risks and whether this pandemic, this global pandemic is at a manageable state or not? Well, I mean, you know, everybody wants to be done with the virus, but I'm not sure the virus is done with us. And so what we've seen now mm -hmm. is countries with high vaccination rates begin to just say, given that the last variant was uh, less severe, and by the way, less severe, there's still 60,000 people dying you know, a week from this disease. So it's not, I mean, it's still causing a lot of deaths, but, but less yeah. severe than some of the previous ones. So there is a sense now is, okay, we're over it. And yeah. it is certainly possible that this yeah. might be the last variant, or you might see a reduction in cases over time, but we've had a new variant about every four months. So the challenge is, how do we both you know, hope for the best, but prepare for the worst? How do we make sure that we continue to move to protect people who might be at high risk in case there is a pi or a sigma or a, a, you know, a rho variant um, that comes out, which conceivably could be more severe, it could be less severe, it could be more severe. So, you know, from our perspective, it isn't over yet. And we have to watch carefully what's happening and make sure that we provide the best protection we can for those around the world. Yeah, no, absolutely. Shifting to um, a wonderful human being that we both have great admiration and respect for. Uh, you mentioned that President Mandela or Nelson Mandela was the first chairman of Gavi. Can you share with us a particular, you know, I'm sure you had many moments with Madiba, but is there a particular moment that stands out for you, a, a, a place and time where Madiba really, you know, inspired you in some way? I mean, in all ways, but um, I think perhaps for me, the one of the most interesting things was, um, you know, we would have technical meetings trying to, for example, get people interested in financing and you'd bring all these financial people and people discussing what the epidemiology of diseases are and the cost effectiveness. And, and he had a way to cut through all of it and just say something like, you know, the, uh, the place you are born should not define whether you live or die, you know, and and that these these tools should be available to everyone because they can make a difference like that. And he spoke with such moral authority, you know, with mm -hmm. such um, the deep voice, the, <laughs> the strong statement that all of the people who were there arguing about the cost effectiveness of that, it just yeah. stopped everybody. and. And people listened, and, and of course, that meant that they saw the bigger picture. And um, I think this is a, a really bigger picture story because right now, today, vaccines are the most widely distributed health intervention in the world. 90 yeah. to 91% of, 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 of uh, people get access to at least one dose of a routine vaccine. Now that means nine to 10% don't. And those are two thirds below the poverty line. That's um, uh, about 50% uh, of the under five mortality occurs just in that nine to 10% of the population. So our goal is to try to extend immunization out to those populations. But 
the idea now that we've had such a big reduction around the world with very inexpensive tools relatively for every yeah. dollar you invest in immunization you get a 54 dollar return there's almost nothing wow. like that so you know wow. it's that it's that um um taking something that can make so much of a difference and make sure it really gets to people who need it yeah and do you recall when that was was it at a particular board meeting i mean is there a <clears throat> You know, I, I remember the event well, but I can't tell you it was at a board meeting. And the reason I can tell you that is because I had um, I had been I also in my free time had been an expedition doctor. I did a lot of expeditions around the world and I had been in Namibia working to see if the, the Fish River Canyon was navigatable in uh, in rainy season. And I had a horrible fall and shattered my legs and had emergency oh. surgery and I left. I got evacuated. And I got back home and I was having this meeting on financing and with Nelson Mandela. And I said to my girlfriend at the time, um, I actually mm -hmm. got engaged on that trip, but I said, um, nice. you know, I really, I, I really ought to go to this meeting. And she said, she's the physician also. She said, you know, uh, anybody else, I would have said it's crazy, but you live on airplanes. So we got right back on the airplane. I proposed on the flight out. And the amazing thing is that one of the flight attendants recognized me and said, didn't we just evacuate you a few weeks ago? Yeah. And, and yeah. sure enough, I went back. And so I do remember the timing. It was around 2001, but- um, 2001. It, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a wonderful story. You know, you, you alluded to, you, you know, you alluded to this earlier, Dr. Berkeley. I mean, obviously there's a very strong moral case the case for the skeptics, the scientific case, what do you think we still need to do from a leadership point of view to convince, persuade, inspire people in terms of the scientific case? How do we get over this hurdle in terms of helping people understand that, you know, it's not about I'm okay, that's fine, you know, there's no more risk to me, so why should I care or worry about whether anyone's left behind? Are there any other examples or thoughts of where you've been able to persuade an audience that is more skeptical? And what does that require from you as a leader and from other leaders in the world? Well, well first of all, I think there is a moral ethical thing. So if I mm -hmm. wanna say something bad or lie for a political purpose, I mean, you can argue you shouldn't do that ever anyway and, and have yeah. live a life of honesty. But um, I think you cross a line when you say things and, um, and, and create false knowledge that can kill people. Sure. And I think that's what we dealt with here. And one of the challenges is do people have the courage to stand yeah. up in that circumstance and say, you know, the, the, the emperor has no clothes or or this is not the right way to behave. And we we had a number of political leaders who were passing information that was clearly false. It was known as false. And, you know, the people around them also supported those falsehoods because they didn't want to call it out. And I think that's a very dangerous place to be. And so for me, the really critical issue here is having enough confidence to, to say um, you know, no, this isn't right. And, and yeah. to try to use that voice to make sure of influence, because you never know who's able to reverse these things, particularly if these things are being said by powerful leaders. And so, you know, for me, that's been an experience in, in you know, through my life is trying to use science to drive things as much as possible. And by the way, science isn't perfect. Sometimes, you know, we learn new things and you have to change your previous things, but it's the best thing we have. And if you're using the best science of today, then you're in the best position to, um, you know, get the best outcome. And that's really what we want to do here. Yeah. Do you think Mandela's leadership is still relevant today? And if so, why? I think it's absolutely relevant today. And I think the some of the key things that he did, um, you know, here's a man who spent 27 years in prison and who um, should have emerged more radicalized, more angry, more, you know, spiteful than when he went in. And of course he didn't, and that's, you know, yeah. history. And, and the fact that he, 
um, you know, created um, truth and reconciliation commissions and tried to um, take the anger down a level and try to have people work together for a better Africa, a better South Africa, are exactly the type of leadership skills you need in this new world. And, and one of the things I think about when I think about COVAX, okay, yeah. it wasn't perfect. It was better yeah. than previous attempts. We should learn for the future. But I also think about what's the relevance for other things. So if I look at climate change as an example, mm -hmm. you know, here's an example of a disease that was killing people, killing family members, killing people around the world. If we can't come together for that, how hard is it to come together to deal with something that's a much slower? It's, you know, it eventually will kill people and do things, but it's a slower process. And yeah. that's why you need leadership that is that really will do the right thing, take that long term view. Um, it's it's absolutely critical now for the good of the world. And, and we're so just in time. We're so quick. We're so into political yeah. cycles, you know, the Internet moment. Yeah. We need that longer term leadership. That's what's going to be yeah. critical. Yeah. In fact, you kind of led me into the, you know, what I was curious to ask you is that is COVID and, and the global pandemic a dress rehearsal for climate change? Yeah, I think it is. And I, and I think um, in some sense, we partially succeeded, but partially failed. And mm -hmm. I think one of the things we have to do is, is um, it's, I mean, and virus is a good example of that. I mean, I'm in, I'm in Switzerland right now. If Switzerland vaccinated everybody, but if all the countries around it didn't vaccinate anybody and, you know, the diseases are still moving around, you still threaten Switzerland. And, and the yeah. same thing, if Switzerland did a perfect green environment, and um, everybody around it was still polluting heavily, you know, it would come to Switzerland, the climate would change, all of that. So I think, you know, these are the most difficult things because to get the world in order here, you have to do some sacrifice for the greater good, but that sacrifice for the greater good is also for your greater good or your family's greater good. And so it's an issue of that timing of view. If you say, I'm only interested in my next quarterly profits, it's a yeah. very different view than if you say, I'm interested in the world my children will inherit. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned when you brought the parties together in terms of COVAX that there wasn't a separate entity set up. It was a temporary structure. Are there any lessons from COVAX and dealing with this global pandemic in terms of how to organize the world in the event of climate change from a structure, from a governance point of view? Well, <clears throat> there are a lot of overlapping principles and there's a lot of innovation that's been used. Um, uh, so, for example, we have a financing structure called IFM, the International Financing Facility for Immunization. It was a brainchild of, of Gordon Brown. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one of the amazing things that it does is it says to, to donors, look, you know, if you will make a legal commitment to pay over time, we then can go to the capital markets using those guarantees and take the money out at any point. So it gives you complete flexibility. So if, yeah. if somebody puts $50 million a year per year for 20 years, that's a billion dollars. That billion dollars you can take out on day one, more or less. I mean, there's some carrying yeah. charges and other things. And so what that allows you to do is front load. And this turned out to be a really good thing for epidemics because, you know, when an epidemic hits, it's not like countries have money just hanging around, not doing anything, and they may oh. or may not have space in their budget. So this allowed um, uh, countries to say, OK, I can you know, take a little bit out over a longer time period, but allow that money to come up front. Those types of creative instruments are really important to be able oh. to do things. And, and I think what we have to do is, is really look at these um, these lessons and ways of working. I think the hardest thing is going to be to get um, the global commons to come together and agree. Now, not everybody has to do exactly the same thing, but it has to be aligned enough that we're not going off in, in all different directions. And I think yeah. that's one of the important lessons here. Yeah, that's great. Just out of interest, I know on April the 10th, 2013, in fact, the year Madiba passed away, you were the a recipient of an honorary doctorate in philosophy at the Nelson Mandela um, University in the Eastern Cape in South Africa. Can you describe that moment? What did it mean to you? And did you visit Madiba on that trip? 
Um, I did not visit Mediva on that trip, but I must say it was incredibly inspiring um, to me to have this degree from the name of this um, great um, uh, leader. And, um, and certainly in my remarks, I made that point in the role he had. And, and frankly, Grasa Michelle afterwards continued on that work. And, and Grasa actually gave us the opportunity to use the Nelson Mandela name as, as part of an immunization lecture series. And, um, and um, I also um, had opportunities to um, work with her going forward. So, um, you know, this meant a lot to me. And I have to say also, it meant a lot to me to be in a university and see so many young minds um, yeah. you know, coming to that level of academic excellence. And um, I, I didn't go to do a seminar. They didn't ask me to, but I saw all of these people, you know, the kids came over to me. And, and so yeah. I said, my God, can I do a seminar? And they said, well, well, yeah, sure. You know, and I did a yeah. spontaneous seminar and, and people just love to talk and ask. And so um, I must say that's a really important part of creating the next generation of Africans. Yeah, absolutely. And just a couple of fun facts. I mean, I, I know that you grew up in New York. Um, I believe as a child, you were interested in chemicals and worked, I think, for a wind chemical company. What, what kind of got you into science and chemicals? What, what led to that early nine-year-old employment contract? Yes, well, it wasn't an employment contract. You're not allowed to work at nine. And, and um, I had gotten interested in, um, uh, my father wasn't a chemist. He had actually wanted to be a doctor, but during the depression, he had to go and work in the steel mills and never did that. And, but mm -hmm. he had had a college chemistry textbook and he said it was really interesting. He gave it to me and it was an older textbook, but I read it from cover to cover and I just loved it. I thought it was really interesting. And so I found this chemical company that was near me. I had a little chemical set and I went there and the owner of it, I walked in and I was walking around and apparently he told me that I looked like a kid in a candy store. You know, my <laughs> eyes were big and I was looking at things and he said, you know, do you want to help out in, in the store? And I said, my God, yes. And he said, well, I can't pay you because you're underage, but I can let you take home some equipment. So I had the best laboratory anybody could imagine in my closet, um, very sophisticated laboratory in my closet and, and uh, learned an enormous amount. And of course, chemistry remained one of my favorite subjects. Yeah. And, uh, and how, long, how long did you continue to, you know, visit this chemical store it was a, it was a few years um at the end the store had had some financial troubles it wasn't as as in to have you know kind of hobbyist in chemistry and it eventually closed which is unfortunate yeah. but occasionally i i go by that street and think fondly of those of those moments and what a fun thing to do and now my daughter who is 17 loves chemistry i i don't think i forced her into it, but maybe yeah. it's genetic and she's, that's her favorite subject. So it makes me very happy to hear that. That's wonderful. And, and I believe you also had a very interesting experience when you were doing some of your medical degrees at Brown University and worked in what I think you called a ghetto uh, clinic in Jacksonville, Mississippi. What took you to Jacksonville? And is there a particular kind of flashpoint uh, working in Jacksonville that really made an indelible impression on your your career choices. Well, let me let me take a step back though, because in, yeah. when I was a young boy in New York, I worked at the YMCA, the Young Men's Christian Association, and I okay. was asked to teach chess. And yeah. um, in doing that, um, the first class I came in, a bunch of parents had enrolled their kids, and they were mostly poor kids from the ghetto. And it was a really tough first day because these kids were like, my parents enrolled me in this. I have no interest in this. I'm not going to pay attention. I'm not going to do anything. It was it was just awful. And what was amazing yeah. is after 12 weeks of kind of a weekly thing, the last day you'd see the students all watching for like intent interest for a couple of hours, a game of chess, you know, all loving it. And And what that taught me was, you know, sometimes you have to, drag a little bit somebody to give them the exposure but once they have the exposure you know yeah. people can take off and we ended up with some very good chess players and people who otherwise would have had no engagement in doing that and and that was an important lesson for me but fast forwarding my and, and before you fast forward uh where in new york was that and 
roughly what year was that in New York? So it was um, the West Side uh, YMCA on 63rd and Central Park West. But okay. I also worked with the Bedford Stuyvesant YMCA and the Harlem YMCA and a number of others um, over that time period. And, and it was yeah. it was when I was in high school. So in the um, that would have been in the in the 70s. In the 70s. And were you teaching chess at these various YMCA's? Well, we, we, we had um, um, some of them had chess clubs as well. And so we did some crossover, yeah. you know, uh, 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 things with the students to do chess with other students. And it was really fun to see this. It wasn't only an experience in, in my in my club, but in other clubs as well. OK, wonderful. And and then if we fast forward to Jacksonville. Yeah, it's not it's not Jacksonville. It's Jacksonville, Florida. It's Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, and, I apologize, but, Jackson. Yeah. My dean, who was um, um, saw me as a little bit hyperactive and kind of full of energy and thought, um, you know, he wanted to give me something of a challenge. He sent me to um, Jackson, Mississippi, to an amazing physician, an amazing role model in my life. He was the first black physician to get privileges in Mississippi, Robert Smith. And um, he originally went away to medical school. He um, um, got his degree. He went to a great Northern um, uh, um, in Chicago Hospital, Cook County. He worked there. He got married. He was settled down well. Um, and then he said, no, I have to go back to Mississippi. And his wife said, I'm very happy in Chicago. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm not going to go. But he he went back to Jackson, Mississippi, and he got there and they, he said, I want to get privileges. And they said, well, you have to join the AMA. And they said, well, you know, sorry, we don't allow blacks in the AMA. And so he led the first march on um, the Amer American Medical Association got the first, you know, privileges there and became a hero to the community because he yeah. was able to, to be able to work there. So I got sent down to, um, to, to work there. And I must say it was an extraordinary experience because I arrived in my first day. I went into a Howard Johnson and changed into my little jacket and yeah. tie. And I walked into the waiting room and there were about 150 um, often quite heavy you know, um, people from uh, Southern Mississippi, um, almost yeah. all black and, and, you know, a completely different world from my New York upbringing. And he brought me in, made me family. I lived with a family there and I learned about what the struggles they had were and also the type of health issues and the effects of that. And yeah. I was so inspired that four years later, I came back in my senior year and helped them got designated a National Health Service Corps site so they could get extra help from the federal government. And he came to my medical school graduation and has remained a friend. I visited him about, um, you know, a year ago, took a trip down there, especially just to see him. So a very, very inspiring leader. Um, but I also learned what it meant to be a community doctor. I mean, women would say they would only be delivered by, by him. And I would have to, with him, rush to the hospital to deliver the baby, you know, together. And then we'd go back to what we were doing because, you know, people were so dedicated to um, the role he played. Yeah. How do you think that shifted your, that exposure shifted your view of how you saw yourself in the world and the kind of medicine you were going to pursue? Did that change your thinking? Did it change your trajectory in any way? Well, I mean, I think I, I grew up in a in a lower middle class family, but um, as I was exposed to challenges in different settings and particularly in, in poor populations, you know, I learned about the different problems that made me interested in that. It made me interested in urban health, which ultimately led me towards international health and led me towards infectious diseases and vaccines as the most effective way to deal with that. So it, I, it's not quite linear, but it, it was yeah. all connected. And, and, and these role models in my life were very important because they were about doing the right thing. They were about moral leadership. They were about being in resource um, limited settings, but being able to do as much as you could. And, um, you know, that taught me a lot about um, how to work in these places. And I, I lived in, I, I worked for Jimmy Carter and lived in 
um, Uganda for three years. And, and that was yes. a real, I, I, I joke, I got a PhD in patience when I was there because I was this high, hyper energetic guy and, you know, yeah. and had to slow down my pace for for what was happening in that very resource constraint. That was right after Idi Amin and Abodi and, you know, it was a terrible yeah. time in Uganda. And I was one of the few doctors yeah. in the country. So not only did I do public health work, which is what I went to do, but I also taught at the medical school and, and had my own ward at the hospital. And yes. um, I just got an honorary doctorate from that school for that work this last year after, um, you know, having um, helped them start a new public health school. And, and um, a lot, it's wonderful to see some of the doctors I had training as students now be, you know, senior registrars and, and in a leadership role in the country. Yeah. And what was the pivotal moment in Uganda? I mean, I, you know, is there a particular... It was an absolute pivotal point? moment, so... Yeah. So what happened was I went I went to, to actually help rebuild the immunization system. That was the purpose. But while I was there, I got there and I said, well, you, you know, you, you were the first country to, to talk about AIDS. And, you know, is it is it a heterosexual transmission? What's the you know, what's the yeah. percentage of men and women? And, you know, people were like, that's a good question. So even on my first visit, before I even decided to go, I started to collect information and we mm -hmm. eventually did a sero survey that's to take blood samples to see who was infected and my girlfriend at the time was helping me with the data analysis when i got the first results i said you have the decimal place in the wrong place and she said i don't think so we checked the numbers then i went to the lab and i said clearly this lab assay doesn't work and it turned out that what we were seeing was that proverbial iceberg you know where we saw a few cases of aids on the top but all the infected below it Although in Africa, yeah. they say it's a hippo with the ears above the water and then the big body below it. But um, what was really important about that moment, and this is the critical thing, is uh, President Moy on one side and President Mobuto on the other said, we don't have AIDS here. Tourists keep coming. And when we presented this to President Museveni, I, I did all the right things, confidence intervals, how unsure we were about the data. But the next day in the national newspaper, you know, 790, 512 Ugandans are HIV infected. This was the headline. And yeah. he said, we have to be transparent. We have to work. We can't kill people. We have to do this. And, and that led yeah. to Uganda having an amazing um, effort to, you know, deal with AIDS and, and eventually other countries coming around. But again, that was a real leadership moment driven by data, also helped by the fact that um, that uh, some of the military commanders had gone to Cuba and um, Castro had called up the president and said, you have a problem because, you know, I forget what the number was, 50 or 60 percent of the military leaders were infected. And so, wow. um, you know, it was certainly on his mind. But but it was really another example of kind of a breakthrough in leadership. Yeah, that that's a remarkable story. I wondered, you know, in this current moment, Dr. Berkeley, what are the the big issues that keep you awake at night right now? What do you think from a leadership point of view, and you have this amazing global perspective, what do you think are the three biggest leadership challenges that we are facing? Well, besides Ukraine at this moment and the question of whether the leader of you know, Russia is going to be rational in this moment because that's a very yeah. scary thing given the, 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 the tools at his I control. Guess. But it connects back to what we're doing. I mean, obviously, um, what I'm scared about is infectious diseases. And, you mm -hmm. know, decades ago, there was a sense infectious diseases are over. You know, we don't have this problem anymore. Yeah. We have antibiotics. We have good lab, you know, good hospitals, good labs. But of course, you know, we're only around the corner from the introduction or, or um, you know, a new virus, a new disease appearing. And I had an opportunity to identify my own disease at one point and name it and, and, you know, a terrible disease and understand it. So it's particularly poignant to me. And so, you know, the challenge here is how do we get people to take that seriously, to prepare for it, to have the tools ready that can yeah. be there in case we need it. So those mm -hmm. are the things that are scariest to me. And then the last thing is this issue of trust. I talked about it in terms of, of leadership and having people you know, be reliable in their information sources. But yeah. um, if you don't have trust in your leader, 
then you are really in a difficult situation because how do you get that contract of you know making some pain as we talked about to get long-term good things you have to really yeah. say look this leader's doing the right thing for me even if it doesn't always feel like it and if you don't have that then it becomes very hard to take difficult decisions of course of course and in our final few moments are there any kind of you know any final thoughts that you have around what the world is calling us out to do from a leadership point of view in terms of shaping our future either broadly or any final words that you think you know Mandela would share with world leaders today? Well, I think if he was here, he would probably be disappointed at, at Africa's not moving more towards a um, more democratic norm. I'm sure he'd be unhappy about some of the disturbances that are occurring today. But I think most importantly, what he mm -hmm. saw and what he wants, and it's a similar thing to what I saw with my leader in Mississippi or what I learned in Uganda or anywhere else, is everybody wants to get ahead. Everybody wants to have a better life, better life for their children. And, and to do that, we need to do it more sustainably, and that's critical in terms of a world of climate change. But we also yeah. need to pay attention to the disparities. And I think that's the hardest thing right now. We have the highest disparities between the rich and the poor that have sure. you know, been seen, if not in history, certainly in recent history. And that's not a good place to be because we know what mm -hmm. happens when those disparities get big enough. And there are a lot of resources that could help lift up the world. And the question is, is how do we, how do we make that happen? Well, it's been such a it's been such a joy to speak with you, Dr. Berkeley, and I, I really look forward to hearing more and learning more. And I hope you'll come back again and share more of your insights and lessons with us as we navigate a very turbulent and difficult time in the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Seth Berkeley has delivered leadership excellence and impact on a global scale that most of us still imagine or aspire to. He co-founded COVAX, which was an international emergency response to a global pandemic, a pandemic that was the worst in more than a century, and he did so with no mandate, no money, and no staff. Within a rapid period of time, they'd raised $11 billion, engaged 193 nations, distributed 1.2 billion doses to 144 countries. One may ask, how? In his own words, it took unquestionable credibility and a towering track record of trust. And yet the alarming news is that despite these successes, the world is still unprepared or ill-prepared for the next global pandemic, or what he calls the big one. To date, COVID-19 has infected more than 600 million people claimed 15 million lives and cost the global economy $11 trillion and still counting. And although many of us do say that we understand no one is safe unless everyone is safe, we still do not think, act and lead in a way that demonstrates we truly believe that. If COVID is the dress rehearsal for climate change, in this new global age where global threats transcend our national borders, my question to you is what will it take for you, your family, your friends, your loved ones to wake up, stand up and speak out? It is a crucial question because the world needs you to lead boldly too. So until next time, please stay safe, Take thoughtful, bold action, sign up, share with your friends and join our global leadership movement for change. Leading boldly is about making clear, thoughtful choices. And bold leadership is about taking bold action just one small step at a time. One small step for you, but together, one giant step for humanity. Take care and take thoughtful, bold action. Thank you for listening to this episode of Leading Boldly into the Future. Please find links and connections mentioned in this show in our blog and never miss an episode by subscribing at ann-pratt.com. 
That's A-N-N-E dash P-R-A-T-T dot com. May these insights from inspiring industry leaders, remarkable disruptors, and courageous champions of change bring forth a brand new you, emboldened, empowered, and ready to inspire hope. Come back soon. Share with your friends. Sign up on and prattcom and join our movement for change. Why? Because the world needs you to lead boldly too.